Welcome back to 60 Minutes. There was a lot to like about Imran Khan when he played cricket. He was a fiery fast bowler and, of course, an inspirational captain for his beloved Pakistan. He was busy off the field too, a very handsome hit with the ladies. In the 20 years since his retirement from international sport, Imran's popularity has soared. But he's become what he said he never would, a politician who's now in line to become Pakistan's next Prime Minister. And it's a country that could well do with his help. We've all just got to hope that the terrorists or his political opponents don't kill him first. It's an incredible sight. Thousands of Pakistanis are waiting for their hero, Imran Khan. Like a rock god arriving at a sellout concert, Imran's flyover whips them into a frenzy. On the ground, his motorcade is mocked. Wherever he moves, the fanatical masses follow. This is just extraordinary. Imran Khan is in that four-wheel drive somewhere under that mass of people. Imran Khan as a cricketing great. But most of these fans weren't even born when he was making runs and taking wickets. Instead, they know and adore him as a politician, the leader of Pakistan's opposition party, PTI. They hope he'll be their next Prime Minister. Well, you know, when I was playing cricket, there were crowds. But the crowds now, because of politics, is way beyond anything uh, I had ever experienced. Imran, you know, it's interesting because when 60 Minutes interviewed you some 20 years ago, you said then, I know I'm not meant to be in politics. What changed? I began to realize after a while that if someone like me who is blessed with everything, who has everything, who doesn't need anything, and has so much love from these people. Should I just spend the rest of my life living off cricket and having a very easy life, or should I try and make a difference? But there's every chance making a difference will kill him. They're on the roof as well. Pakistan has long been one of the most dangerous countries on the planet, and it's next door to another, Afghanistan. There's no shortage of threats. The sniper moves in. But the biggest risk for Imran actually comes from within the corridors of power. Three shots. Political assassinations are endemic in Pakistan. Is your life threatened here by doing what you do? Well, the Interior Ministry uh, uh, brought out a statement that I was the top two targets. The Prime Minister and I were the top two main targets. You laugh about that. Well, the point is, I mean, you know, uh, we have this, somehow we have this uh, false sense of security that we live forever. Everyone has to die. It's an unnerving thought. Whenever you're with Imran, he's a prize target. But that's the brutal reality of Pakistan politics. It's a youth revolution, really. Yeah. Imran's main rival is the Prime Minister, Nawaz Sharif who only just won the election two years ago. Imran Khan says the vote was rigged and is now challenging it. Do you think you can run this country, that you can become Prime Minister? I think I'm more equipped than everyone else in this country who's, who's been Prime Minister. Uh, Sharif, the current Prime Minister, this is third time. And each time he comes, him and his family get rich, the country gets poorer. 
The stronghold of Imran's party is in Pakistan's perilous northwest. And today, he's campaigning in Peshawar, which for the past decade has been a front line in the war on terror. Here, even a simple school visit is dangerous. Especially when the charismatically cool Imran arrives and all attempts at security give way to chaos. Michael, how are you? It's good to see you. I'm going to follow you in. A few months ago, just up the road, 138 young school students were slaughtered by the Taliban. So today's visit to this all-girls school is Imran's bulletproof rebuke to the terrorists. This is important though, isn't it, because you have forces in this area that, that don't want to see girls educated. Yeah, that's true, but that's, you know, the few, it's linked with this uh, uh, war on terror, which, uh, uh, you know, which has just caused more fanaticism, you know. Yeah. But as a rule, people want their children, to, girls to be educated. In the past five years, there have been 200 suicide bombings in Pakistan. The attacks are mostly carried out by the Pakistani Taliban, who pose a dilemma for Imran because they operate in areas he now controls politically. This is what they did to a Peshawar mosque earlier this year. And they're the same terrorists who shot but failed to kill outspoken schoolgirl Malala Yousafzai. Imran doesn't condone their violence, but he does deal with them. Terrorism became a threat when our government decided to join the American war of uh, uh, war on terror. Your critics have called you Taliban Khan. Do you believe that you should be negotiating with the Taliban to try and fix this problem? There was only one way to deal with this, and that was a political solution. We've got so much like Polly's everywhere, Imran Khan doesn't flinch at criticism and doesn't stop touting for votes. In one day with him, we toured a police training centre. He took radio talkback calls, held four press conferences, a live national TV interview. This hospital will um, cater for this whole province as well as Afghanistan. And showed us the new cancer hospital he's building dedicated to his mother. And despite this being a male-dominated, ultra-conservative corner of Pakistan, Imran doesn't forget the other 50% of his electorate. Showing off these women training to be commandos is a surefire way to secure the female vote. Do you think your husband, do you think Imran can be Prime Minister of this country? I think that if life was fair in Pakistan, if there was, uh, if there was justice, he would have been Prime Minister a very long time ago. One female Imran has already won over is his new wife, Raham Khan. A popular TV presenter here in Pakistan and in the UK, she married the superstar Imran six months ago. You're coming into a partnership here that is very powerful in this country.